Thank you, Diane, for those um, very gracious words, actually. Um, you're absolutely right about the collaborative efforts on the part of the BSA community and everyone who's participated over the course of a number of years, actually, to, to be able to move the organization to the point at which we're at right now. And so we're really excited about that, and we're looking forward to moving in the next, uh, I think, two or three weeks or four weeks or whatever it is. And uh, also happy to have um, Eric Howler here tonight, and um, you'll hear from him as well as we sort of share in the uh, discussion about the topic of collaboration. There are many challenges facing us today. I actually like this picture. It's one of my favorite uh, things to think about um, because to me it illustrates the ultimate challenge, understanding the universe and how we fit within it. As a single isolated individual, how much of an impact can we make in terms of finding the answer? Our world, in our world, innovation is often fostered through insights gained through journeys into other disciplines and from information gathered from new connections. This image clearly represents tremendous collaboration on the part of mankind to achieve a far-reaching goal. The topic of collaboration is really quite a broad one and the shift to towards collaborative efforts is gaining momentum as the real benefits of sharing ideas and information across disciplines become apparent. From the automobile and entertainment industries to the highly competitive pharmaceutical and biotech industries. In the field of architecture, of course, uh, one doesn't typically design and build one's own, one's own projects themselves, not even the sole practitioner, typically. There are masons, carpenters, engineers, and others who contribute to the effort. Even the master builder Brunelleschi, Renaissance man, also had others who contributed to that effort. Over time, the architecture profession has become more and more fragmented and specialized as bits and pieces of the architect's traditional role is taken on by others who are interested in the built environment. Disciplinary lines begin to blur and timelines tighten as we experience rapid shifts innate to the chaotic times that we live in. And our world is continually shrinking as new technologies and other instruments give way to new processes, new alliances, and new outcomes. Architects are inherently broad thinkers, visionaries, and problem solvers. So how do we maximize our collective wisdom to solve some of the challenges facing us today? How do we characterize the expanding definition of practice? Over the past few weeks, I've modified this talk, this presentation, a few times, actually, as you can imagine. <laughs> and I thought, why not make it a little bit more fun, a little bit more interactive, and something that's more than just sort of speaker, uh, audience, and Q&A. I thought it might be much more fun to have a little bit of a brief introduction and then to open it up to sharing ideas. And that occurred to me when I sat down with Eric and Mijin last week to really sort of began to, to talk about process. And I learned so much more uh, about their practice than I did from the interviews, from the design competition, and also from the book. <laughs> so the, uh, the sort of stories themselves, you know, the pitfalls, the, the benefits of collaboration uh, outside of contracts, the risks that we take as a, uh, as a profession, I think is really fascinating if we could sort of engage in, in more of a dialogue. So this evening, I would like to illustrate the notion to begin uh, the process of uh, collaboration through two scenarios. The first one is through uh, the use of architecture and design uh, as a means to foster a collaborative environment which fosters, uh, uh, which uh, helps the clients to reach their, uh, their business goals or their business vision. And the, the second scenario is to illustrate the collaborative process. And again, I would, I would ask Eric to 
you know, begin by showing some of their projects and then asking them to, to talk a little bit about that process, which I actually found quite fascinating. So, you know, I started to think as I went through, you know, how to, to really address this, uh, this talk tonight and what does collaboration mean. It means quite a lot of different things and we'll touch on that also as we uh, go along. This is a, an image of the uh, Basel, uh, the Novartis campus in Basel, Switzerland. Now, this is before construction uh, really started on a major scale. So back in 2001, Dr. Daniel Vizella of Novartis, uh, the chairman, and he was the president and uh, chairman at the time, but he had a vision to, uh, to make a big radical change, actually, in the direction of the company worldwide. And this is their uh, site, which is about uh, 20 hectares or 49 and a half acres uh, in that campus. In terms of the work uh, culture, he wanted to, to see a, sh a shift in that and really sort of move away from the scientists and other people on campus working on their own. Uh, Dr. Vassello was interested in having the biologist, chemist, marketing, IT persons, and, and other uh, people on campus work side by side um, in the same environment, sharing ideas, um, interacting with each other socially. And he believes strongly that their collaborative efforts uh, fostered uh, by an environment of multidisciplinary interaction would speed up, ultimately speed up the drug discovery process. And uh, they've invested a lot of money, a lot of effort, uh, into making that vision come true. This is how the campus looks today. The former one sort of grew out of the old, um, I guess it grew more or less organically out of the, uh, the, the old factories, uh, manufacturing plant that they had at the time. So um, this is looking at, uh, I think this one was taken last year or this year, but um, the master plan was the brainchild of Professor Vittorio Lampugnani, who is a professor at the ETH in Zurich and also an um, architect who has his own practice in Milano. The very formal grid of this layout, and, and you may know that each of those individual buildings are uh, designed by world-renowned uh, architects, and they're, they're actually really beautifully executed. But the formal grid layout of the pedestrian campus is made up of a network of buildings um, which house collaborative type spaces on the ground floor. And the idea is to, that they wanted to create something of a little bit of a city and uh, to, to really sort of bring people out of their labs and offices to, a, uh, uh, to increase the chances of um, of interacting with other people that they may not have otherwise. So this street is um, called the Fabrikstrasse, and it's sort of factory, factory street, as it were, and you can see the Frank Gehry um, building in the background there. But uh, as I mentioned, on the ground floor of each of the buildings, there's either a restaurant or a cafe or dry cleaners or a bank, um, things of that nature to really sort of bring people together. And what this is also doing is redefining what is work. And often, if you're sitting in a cafe having a coffee with your colleagues, in the past that wasn't thought to be actual work. <laughs> but here, that is uh, what they're trying to encourage so that they can, can really uh, increase those ser serendipitous moments where you know, the aha idea comes and um, people realize they're, they're actually working on similar ideas. Or, so this is one of the parks, and um, this is South Park, and that is the forum. So there are lots of, uh, of uh, these types of social spaces, but, uh, but that interaction also occurs within the office spaces and the laboratories as well, very open. And it was a, a really quite a, a big cultural shift for people who had once been working in um, enclosed offices on their own. I thought this was kind of fun. Um, collaboration equals innovation. It could also equal speed and uh, better quality and a number of other things. 
Even Henry Ford was interested in hearing what everyone else thought. He says every man on the payroll was invited to contribute ideas, and the good ones were implemented without delay. I included this project by Zaha Hadid because it also focused on really bringing workers together in terms of uh, people who are uh, working in uh, the executives in the offices. This is the new uh, central, uh, central plant building, the administration building in the center, uh, flanked by three um, of the manufacturing buildings. And again, the idea is to bring a variety of different types of workers together and to really bring the executives in close contact with uh, the factory workers. And the cars are sort of zipping by as uh, people are on their way to meetings. Uh, people in rece reception area are also able to uh, see the products and interact with each other in some of the social spaces that perhaps they may not have, uh, have done otherwise. Speed and quality. So there are a number of reasons why uh, people uh, may wish to collaborate. I have worked um, on a number of projects where uh, I, I think of in a more integrated fashion, where all the members of the team are brought together from the very beginning. So all of the engineers um, have met with clients with us and uh, you, we can talk about the pros and the cons. We talk about constructability issues. The general contractor is also there. We're looking at pricing. It's a very transparent type of process. So when I was with the Stubbins Associates, I was the chief designer for this project. This was for Novartis, and it was really quite early on in the, in the process of uh, really trying to execute that transparent vision um, and that one of collaboration that I mentioned earlier. <coughs> so this is the old Neko Candy Factory. I'm not sure if you guys have ever been in there before. But um, at the time that, that we started working on this project, it was, they were actually still making candy there. And um, actually, when they started construction, they were still making candy there on the, on the third floor, uh, at least for a while. But we had 20 months to really achieve this design from start to finish, sort of programming to moving in and people working in their labs. So if we had gone down the traditional design, build, bid route, we would never have finished. And, um, and to be honest, there were some really, really tough challenges on this project, which may have prevented the design from ultimately being what it is. Because some of those problems we had to solve as we went along. And there were constructability issues, there were cost issues, there was abatement issues. You name it, it was there. And uh, once we all got on board with working together and, you know, as Diane mentioned before, really sort of building an integrated team. We, we all sink or we all swim. And no one wanted to be the one to let the side down. So we had this shared vision, shared enthusiasm. And the quality, I don't think either would have been as it, um, as it was if we hadn't worked well together. So this is the um, sort of a footprint of the ground floor. So to reinforce, to get back at the concept of the architecture, which is process interaction, as well as this interactive team of people working together, one of the things we thought immediately was that uh, this is Mass Ave at the bottom, by the way, and this is Lansdowne Street toward the uh, right hand, your right hand side. So we. Um, thought from the beginning that we should limit the points of entry to the building. I mean, if you really want to get people to interact with each other, then um, one of the important things uh, to, to be able to think about is how do you bring them together? Um, I do, I'm not necessarily a believer, and if you build it, they'll come. I think uh, that you have to sort of coax them into it a little bit. So one of the ways in which we did that is that we limited the entrances and the exits. And then we created this six-story um, amoeba-shaped atrium in the middle, which I refer to as the, the nucleus. And that's because uh, not just the scientific piece, but because it really is a point at which everything happens. And then you get the collaborative um, uh, functions around that atrium space around the perimeter. And it's also important, as we mentioned, for people to, who are leaving the labs, these social spaces were really important. 
Um, and so this view, this is the cafe area with some uh, uh, conference, room, conference rooms. And those, uh, this area has some very nice views toward Boston. And this is that lobby space. The elevators were one of those challenges that, that we mentioned. And I don't think I've really ever heard a person building a building you know, say, well, we can't get rid of those, you know, because they were on the chopping block for value engineering. <laughs> and uh, so we, we managed to find ways to work together to you know, really sort of keep the cost down and to stay within our budget and to stay on track. And everyone on the team had to contribute to that effort to make it happen. So that's a view looking up at the, uh, in the six-story atrium space. The elevators are completely round. There's nothing to hide. You know, we wanted to really understand how all the components worked so that we can orchestrate them properly. And uh, you know, the, the counterweights are counter to how they're typically installed, but we wanted them that way. And so we had to get the right people involved to, to really understand how uh, to make that happen. And that's looking down on the space. And again, you know, this isn't glass just for the sake of it, but the idea is that if, if you're in that elevator and, some, and someone from you know, Germany or where have you is in that elevator, then you're going to see each other, whereas you might actually miss that person if you were in a shaft you know, inside of an enclosed space. And so we've gotten uh, really quite a lot of feedback saying that uh, you know, the building works and uh, you know, I wouldn't have known that that person was here if I hadn't seen them. Uh, <coughs> passing by in that, in that space. So you have to go through here. But you want it to be a nice experience as well. And also in the labs, we wanted to have those open to the corridor. So behind the photographer here is a glass wall to the corridor. So as someone described it, you're walking down the corridor and suddenly you find yourself in the lab. So we really wanted to have that transparency and openness so that people are working in a more visible way. And this is what I refer to as a bubble room. There are plenty, uh, there's two of, each, uh, two of these on each floor. And uh, there are movable screens, but they're not for purposes of hiding, they're for purposes of writing. So uh, again, it was a little bit of a shock sometimes to people who are accustomed to being uh, in an enclosed space and on their own. Uh, but they're very much uh, used and people are becoming more accustomed to that open, transparent way of working. Someone once said, you can have anything you want as long as you don't mind who gets the credit. And I wish I could remember who said that so I could give them credit for that quote. <laughs> but um, if you think about it, that's kind of true. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's when you're working in a disciplinary way, it's hard to know who came up with the idea. It's like, how did we get that idea? I'm not sure. And that's okay, because it is part of a, a team effort. And I'd like to introduce the firm of Howler and Yoon. And speaking of ideas and uh, collaboration, I'd like to have Eric just come up very briefly and uh, discuss this project. And, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the team that, uh, that you work with. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I feel like I'm uh, sitting so far from everybody. Uh, and I hope we're, uh, we're loud enough. We want it to be casual. So Can you hear us? Can you hear us? No? <laughs> um, th this mic That's is for okay. that. <laughs> Well, feel free to come a little closer if you'd like. Um, uh, Audrey, uh, I know Audrey uh, because of the BSA, actually. Uh, when I moved uh, to Boston, I, I, I called Richard and I said, can I get involved somehow? And, and he said, sure. And he put me on some juries. And uh, before I knew it, I was on the, on the editorial board of Architecture Boston with um, Keith. And um, so before I knew it, I was sort of involved in this community. And I met Audrey. Uh, through the BSA, when the competition came up, I said that's a really brave uh, idea, you know, to have a competition for the new BSA uh, space and not to just award it to.
to the firm that had designed the most centers for architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that's how I sort of got sort of uh, involved uh, here. Um, we've been talking over the last year about what it takes to make a successful project, and uh, hopefully this one will be uh, successful. But uh, we've, we've also talked a lot about design, design process, um, and how does that work? How do you, how do you uh, have a successful um, practice? Um, I would say our practice uh, is not a conventional one. Um, and I, I showed Audrey some projects that we'd done, uh, which really did uh, sort of... Uh, shock me. It, it, okay, <laughs> um, it was shocking. Um, it was, it was, but it was shown because these were unconventional um, configurations of team players to produce successful outcomes, I hope. So um, I showed this to Audrey. This was a, a developer building in Washington, D.C. Uh, this developer had seen a project we had done in a, in a magazine. You know, so the question is, where do projects come from? And he's seen it in a MIT alumni news magazine, so not like architecture record, uh, but a kind of one of those things that sometimes you get and you sort of throw away. But he had seen a project. He invited us to come down and, and look at this space, and he said, um, can you help me? I'm renovating this space. So um, we, we proposed a couple of things. One was um, signage. He was looking for some signage. He was also looking for some public art, which was kind of unusual. Um, he thought maybe we could pay for the art with the signage budget or something. Um, it, was, it was a bold idea. We designed some signage, uh, but we also designed a kind of interactive public art piece. Um, and this is something that we've been involved with a little bit um, because we, we did one project sort of not knowing how to do it. And when we won the competition, we sort of had to sort of pull it together. Um, and we invited people from the Media Lab at MIT. We, uh, so we've gotten into the habit of doing these things, kind of overreaching, you know, what we know how to do. Uh, and I always say we sort of, we pool our inexperience, you know, to figure <laughs> out what, what we don't know how to do. Uh, because we like to treat every project as a learning experience. Every project is, but we kind of go to extremes to do things we don't know anything about. So uh, we proposed that this uh, sound grove would be touch sensitive. So when you touched it, music would come out of it. Each pole is a different instrument. Each section is a different note. Um, this is an LED uh, net. And we said, wouldn't it be cool if when you walk by it, uh, your image was broadcast into the net? We call it a digital shadow. Um, and that was, you can see the shadow here. It's not a real shadow, it's a digital shadow. So it's a, a video feed from the surveillance camera and it broadcasts into the net. Um, we looked at products and we found this uh, pixel. We didn't find it, we made it actually. We found right. some really ugly lights, uh, but we thought maybe we could develop our own. Um, and so uh, I think it might have been a little reckless, you know, to say, to <laughs> promise a client, uh, we don't need to buy that from Color Kinetics, we can make that. Um, and so we did, we teamed up with an with a electronics engineer in Brooklyn, uh, and he did some research, we figured out how to address it. Um, here he is. Will Pickering, we prototyped it, we mocked it up, we convinced the owner to give us $30,000 to test this thing. We did a full R&D uh, process on it. Um, and here it is on the sidewalk. The idea is the pixels are far enough apart, produces a very low resolution image. Uh, you can see through it, and that's the beauty of it. It's a net, so people walking on the sidewalk are people on the other side. Uh, when you walk up to it, there's a kind of scrolling sign of uh, the building address, but there's also your own shadow uh, projected in it. And here we were sort of testing uh, some different uh, behavior. Um, but this was a project that um, we really didn't know how to pull off. Uh, but we knew that we could find people to help us. Um, so you, you, when we were talking last week, you mentioned trespassing into other disciplines. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, okay, so I, I think, you know, if we follow the strict definition of architects, you know, we do these things. We're rights and responsibilities, these are the things that we do. The boundaries. Boundaries. Um, and we found that oftentimes there's something really exciting, you know, just beyond that, you know. And we think of architecture not as just the kind of distribution of material and space, but the kind of environment, the atmosphere, the, the behavior, the response, the social aspect. So we want to design all those things. Um, we want to people to. We want to design how people interact with the architecture. So we've trespassed into landscape, lighting design, interaction design, music. Music. Uh, we we met uh, an, a sound composer uh, to sort of 
uh, design the sounds for this thing. Uh, and then the, the owner got really involved in this and he wanted to work with us on the sound files and, and at the end of the day he's like, I want to be a collaborator on this. And, and so this was a, a project that took uh, an electronics engineer, a couple of different fabricators, um, sound composer, architects, there were lighting designers, there were associate architects, it was a huge, huge team. But it produced, I would say, an atmosphere, an environment, an, a condition where people were interacting on the sidewalk, bumping into each other in front of their building. Um, and and um, so that's just the sound, sound files. Here we're making it. Uh, we sort of stumbled into a design build scenario. That's why I was surprised, because I didn't realize that you actually made that piece and installed it. Yes. And I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> um, and we talked about pitfalls. Um, and this is something that, that we really didn't want to do. Uh, one of the guys doing it went out of business. And, and we had to sort of jump in and, and finish it. Because you were on the hook, actually, we right? Were. The owner mm -hmm. asked us, uh, what are you going to do now? Um, and so here we are. That's me, Jin, And that's me. We're and it's 2 a.m. Well, it was late um, <laughs> in our apartment making circuit boards. Uh, for the touch sensitive poles. Um, here they are in Mijin's parents' garage. We call this sort of <laughs> garage band architecture. Um, and here it is on the site. And, and they're, they're really uh, gorgeous. They're beautiful. They light up. And the thing is, you're standing there touching this thing. Someone walks up to you and says, how does it work? You say, I don't know. And you start talking to people. And that's the kind of thing we wanted to design. We wanted to design the interactions between people who are strangers that happen to run into each other on the sidewalk. Um, and, and I think it really took a kind of uh, a leap of faith on the client side. It took a crazy amount of uh, sweat equity and, and uh, sleeplessness on our side. Uh, but we pulled off something that was pretty, uh, pretty special. Mm -hmm. um, and that project, you know, it, it did win some awards. It got published. It led to more projects. And, and you know, people are now asking us to do more of these crazy um, design buildings. And you things. did. And, and you did. did. We didn't really learn our lesson. Can, um, can you talk about the library okay. piece, which um, is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you do yeah, have no, a... Yeah, no, let me just finish. So, sure. Um, the library was something that um, uh, some friends of ours in Boston, uh, Sam and Leslie Duvall, uh, who were also sort of involved with the BSA in um, Common Boston and, and, and these things, they've been noticing <laughs> that the public realm is a site that's sort of contested, People are sort of, you know, it's commercial space, is it public space? How do people interact in, in the public realm? And that's something that's interesting to us. It's not within your property line, it's beyond the property line, but it's something we're all invested in. Um, they wanted to do an outdoor reading room uh, in the public realm, and they commissioned us to design it. Um, and so we said, what do you need for a reading room? You need bookshelves, you need places to sit, places to interact. Um, so um, we sort of we collaborated with some students of ours. Uh, this is uh, um, Costanza. Um, he's an MIT student, and we sort of had this sort of uh, sketch sessions where we designed both a uh, bookshelf uh, system uh, with magnets to go together, and these plugs, which um, during the nighttime mode uh, they sort of protect the books. In the daytime mode, uh, they become seating elements. Um, so. This is the crazy part. Um, we Parents garage again? No, this is, this is MIT. But um, we were researching um, roto molding. I don't know if you know what roto molding is. It's like slip casting. You take a mold, you, you squirt a, a chemical plastic into it, uh, you sort of spin it, and so the surface of the mold is coated with the plastic. In 12 minutes, it hardens, and you can pull it out, and you've got this pristine thing with no seams uh, that's an eighth of an inch thick all the way around. So we said, uh, we talked to some people, they said it'll be $30,000 uh, to make a mold. Um, we said, we can make this. So um, <laughs> foolishly, uh, we welded up a frame. There are two servo motors, one here and one on the other side. That's the mold. Um, we poured the resin in, not the respirators, um, gloves. Um, that's the mold. Uh, you pull it out and you've got this beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, and these parts, they have joints, they fit together as these benches. 
so this was actually installed uh, in New York City uh, as an outdoor reading room. Um, here you can see people interacting with the with the program. Um, and again, I think we sort of we sort of jumped into something, maybe foolishly, maybe um, maybe bravely, uh, because we thought we can make something really cool uh, if we sort of. Um, get our hands a little bit dirty and and uh, I think that's part of part of practice is, is finding uh, what you don't know and and trying to find out more about it so I think we collaborate to achieve things but we also collaborate to learn right because we want to talk to people that we think know something we don't know and we want to sort of build a kind of body of, of we call it research um, it's also play um, but I think those are some of the the, the motives for this kind of uh, collaboration. Um. When I was talking to Eric last week and, and Mijin, and then we saw the first project, and he says, well, we would never do that again. And I think you said that maybe two or three times. And um, I was curious, because each time you did learn something mm -hmm. more, and you got that level of you know, satisfaction that, that um, people get after they have um, you know, worked hard at something and have achieved it, and there it is, and people are using it and interacting with it. So normally, you know, we're doing that in the drawing form, and you know, you might make a model of mm -hmm. of, of some things. Of course, you make models, um, but you're building. You were you're actually constructing the the actual real piece. So um, one of the things that came up when we were having that discussion is uh, a question of liability, and I'm sure you know people may be asking that. Uh, you know, it's even a question when you're doing integrated practice. Uh, and I just wonder if, uh, if anyone here has, um, has any stories or uh, even questions that, that you might want to ask or, you know, maybe something that you want to share about your experiences of, of working uh, in a collaborative fashion or trespassing uh, um, beyond your disciplinary boundaries, as it were. Anyone? Question? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Good question. Um, you know, they asked for warranties, you know, um, and we said, well, it's a, cu a custom electronic uh, sound piece. Uh, so it's art. It's it was art. Uh, so there weren't the kind of instruments of service kind of issued, but we definitely produced drawings, fabrication drawings, circuit board designs, you know, um, all these things. We didn't leave them with the owner. I mean, those um, sort of stayed with us. But it's an interesting question. They said, how long will it last, and who do I call when it breaks? Um, and um, th what happened was the, the fabricator we worked with in Brooklyn, he has a maintenance agreement with the owner. Uh, we made more, more of the sound poles than are there, so there's 50% overage. Hmm. When one breaks, uh, they can replace it uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so that was a question, but he said, well, it's essentially, it's an iPod. We made an iPod, and we put it out in the rain, in the snow, in the heat. And I said, well, how long would your iPod last out there? Um, not very long. So uh, there's a questions of obsolescence. There's, a question, there's questions of, of wear and tear. Uh, there's questions of, of durability, you know, these things. So they, they have been replaced several times. In fact, they're, they're being sort of refurbished as we speak. Um, but that comes up a lot in these kind of electronics projects, because there's expectations for architecture that you don't have of electronics. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to synthesize these and integrate them. And um, we, we run into we run into trouble with that all the time. Who owns the design? Who owns the, the documents? Who owns the, the extras that you've got um, the, the owner owns the attic stock. We said this is something you you know you you, you bought thirty, you, you installed twenty. Um, the design, I guess, it's your intellectual it's our property. Intellectual isn't property. It? Mm -hmm. um, us and the electronics engineer and the fabricator. So. Uh, it's you know we've, had, we've been asked to do this again and again. You know I got an email recently from Dubai saying we'd like to put this in Dubai. You know what would it take? And I said well, it's not a product. We can't sell it to you, but we'd be happy to come out and design something new for you. Uh, I've been wanting to do you know some different kind of sensing. I wanted to try something else, mm -hmm. and they said no 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 no. We we really want that thing. It's a lot simpler. <laughs> we don't want to pay you to design something new. But for us, it's not interesting <laughs> to sell a product. We really want to, 
we want to we want to try something. something we're architects. We're unhappy. You know, if we said design the same house again and again, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be happy with sure. that either. Um, so there was a question. Hey, Jeff. I'd uh, be interested in your observations of collaboration in the context of compromise, where, for example, when you involve groups of people, um, you don't want to give up the strength of an idea, uh, but you're negotiating all the time. I just would appreciate your observations. So is that for me or for Eric? Uh, well, or for you. OK, sure. You know, I've, I've been asked that question before, and um, when, I, when I did that NECO building project, um, it was a secret. I couldn't tell anyone else on the team. Um, I couldn't even have anyone do photocopies, and, uh, and I had a weekend to do some concepts. So I came up with three concepts, and I uh, had a meeting, you know, I didn't know that much information because you know, they were still negotiating the terms, potentially, of the lease of the building. And uh, so I had these very small drawings that could fit into a, my small bag. And, uh, and I took out tons of them and put them up on the wall at this meeting. The, you know, I wasn't sure who would be there and, uh, and presented them. And so everyone unanimously selected that scheme, you know, the nucleus scheme. And so then it was a question of, Initially, why would you do that? <laughs> and uh, you know, it's not really that flexible in terms of that space. But that that nucleus piece was really quite uh, a small one relative to the rest of the building. And so um, the concept, the idea, once we worked out, yes, we can do that. And uh, no, we don't have any structural issues, and we're just taking out two columns. Um, then everyone was on board uh, with, with how can we make it happen. But each time we, um, because our, the team got bigger as time went on. And so uh, once we got the, the scientists in to really work on programming those different areas, each time they would point to that nucleus space and say, we can use that space for lab space. And, uh, and I found that, that often it would be uh, one of the engineers on the team or the, uh, someone on the, uh, on the uh, construction manager side who would s respond to that and say, actually, this is the purpose of that space. So it wasn't sort of the architect always defending the design, <laughs> you know, or really sort of trying to express why it needs to be that way. But um, so it wasn't really um, a situation of, um, you know, who's in charge or, or, or whose uh, idea is it or, or how do we make uh, this, you know, it's more sort of how can we make this happen? Uh, how can we get the best out of the design? Um, so I, I think that's one of the strengths that, that architects have is, is really being able to, to do a number of things, to manage multiple um, teams and groups of people. I mean, those workshops that we had were really quite intense uh, in, in terms of information, uh, requirements for the different lab spaces because people were working in different ways. Um, and so it's like, a, um, like an orchestra, you know, it's, it's more than a conduct conductor. Um, and so I, I, I don't think that, that it needs to be necessarily um, one person sort of you know, I mean, ultimately, someone has to make a decision. And um, I think that other people are contributing to that effort, as it were. I, I do think if you can convince the team, the client team, the, the consultant team, the, the contractor's team, to buy into an idea, mm -hmm. and then everybody will fight for the idea. It's not mm -hmm. just you. Absolutely. That's, that's the best way. Absolutely. Like, if you're not the only one fighting for the idea. I mean, I found that on the BSA space, you mm -hmm. know, we presented the stair, everybody said, where can we save money? Right. And then at the end of the day, we weren't the ones that were fighting for the stair. It was different people from the client committee were saying, we can't do that. That's the whole idea. You know, mm -hmm. and that was like, we would go home and be like, oh, that was great. You know, <laughs> it wasn't us fighting for it. Right. You know, because we obviously were, 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 we wanted to happen, but it's great if someone else from the, from the engineer, right. from the client committee, from the contractor can say, that's the idea, and we have to keep that idea. If it's collectively owned, right. that idea, it's not us pushing it all the time. 
then I think that's when things happen. That's when ideas come up and mm -hmm. innovation happens and, and projects get realized. Absolutely. Any other stories? Keith? Questions? <laughs> <laughs> <It's our time>. <laughs> <laughs> so does anyone here work in a collaborative fashion? Uh, anyone ever sort of? Hello. Uh, I mean, I was thinking as you're describing this decision making process of, about, you know, a compromise I made today. And it was easy because we're in a collaborative team. It's, a, it's just building an apartment building. It's not, not anything great. But the contractor, the owner, the architect, the engineers are all working on a team to do the project. And so we try to learn what each person is trying to accomplish. So when a question comes up like, what awnings are you going to put over the retail store doors when there are no retail tenants yet? Because nobody in the right mind would start a business in this location today. You know? So the answer is, well, you look at it from, say, what's, you can take the owner's point of view if you're a team because you're working as a team. And so, yeah, I know what I want, but right now, the right answer is different because I can understand what the owner's trying to accomplish. Absolutely. And um, I don't think people really, um, you know, tend to think of it as a, as a compromise, like you were saying, because, you know, you're, you're working in the same spirit. Um, I often think that, um, if the project that I just showed you or any of the other ones that, that I have uh, worked on uh, certainly recently had been, you know, design, build, bid, I think it would be a different outcome because a lot of things in that project would have had a target on them in terms of, uh, yes, we can save money by getting rid of that or it seems complicated or, or whatever, you know, the issue is. And you have to deal with long lead items. You have to solve problems of uh, constructability. And so if it's after the building has been designed, then you're faced with a lot of potential changes, uh, redrawing. Um, the cost could be much more than, than you know, one would have uh, anticipated. So it is a, a collaborative effort, and uh, very much so in that, in that sense. I wanted to, uh, to also mention that uh, Commodore builders are here, I think. I saw some. There we are. You're hiding back there. So uh, they've been working, um, you know, as Eric mentioned, on the, on the project for the BSA space. And we've also worked with them on uh, some other kind of crazy uh, projects in terms of building things like the 15 days project. And, and maybe you can even talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your experiences. Because as Eric mentioned, with the stair, who's going to build it? <laughs> How's it going to get done? And here's our time frame. So there, there are the normal challenges that you have on each project. And I just, and it was, uh, you know, you guys were looking for a solution. Everyone was looking for a solution. Time was running out. So I wonder if, uh, if maybe um, you could talk a little bit about your experiences and in, in working with architects from the, from the beginning instead of being just sort of handed, you know, bidding a job at the end. And, There is the full performance of the project, and uh, uh, it became, uh, it, without a collaborative effort across the board, uh, it, it would have been a, a challenge to get the stair to where it is today, which is actually in the building, um, and about three quarters of the way uh, across the finish line. It's a very unique, one of a kind uh, stair that presented itself to uh, fabricators across the board in New England, threw their hands up at it. And they said, look, look, we can't, we can't make this. This is going to cost a million and a half dollars. Um, so with a team effort, collaboration with DSA, with Holland and you know, we rolled up our sleeves and, and we found the firms in this country that had the capability of making the stair to, uh, to the specifications that Holland presented. 
There's only two or three companies in the country that can do it. Uh, I think when it's all when it's done and it's presented to the publisher, it's unveiling. Uh, you'll see the, uh, the element that the vision that Ron and Ian were looking for. And without that collaboration, we've you know through the classic general contractor architect, you know, hey, how are we gonna make this work? And, this isn't ever going to work, and you know, we, by, by teaming up, working as a team, um, we looked far and wide and found a, a company uh, in Michigan, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then said, we can do that, we can do that, and we're like, holy moly, this is great, and uh, Well, because other people said they could do it, but then when it really came down to it, they... They said they could do it, they could bend the steel, and, it, and it's unique, and again, it's, uh, if you haven't seen quarter inch uh, steel uh, bent in at various uh, radiuses and angles uh, that is the heart and soul of, of, of the stair, which is the heart and soul of the project, uh, at least from our perspective, I think Eric will agree with that. Sure. Um, so that was the challenge and the collaboration was there and, you know, with, without that, uh, it, it, we wouldn't have you know, made it to where we are today. So it's been, it's been a great experience. Yeah. In one month from today, uh, we'll be turning it over. And, and it's going to be received uh, by all as this one of a kind monumental stair. So that actually leads me to another question for you, Eric. Um, what are the things that that certainly the people on the board thought a lot about? Um, because you, you know, sort of, it was great winning that that uh, competition for your firm. Um, as you as you probably remember, it was an anonymous competition, um, two stage. But the first piece was anon uh, an anonymous, and uh, so Howler and Jung were selected, and then there was a, an interview process and an opportunity for the five teams to refine their design and come back and make a presentation, which you guys did um, a great job on. And then we thought, oh my goodness, your client, you know, consists of about 3,000 architects. <laughs> and so, so then there's collaboration uh, across discipline, disciplinary lines, and then there's collaboration, sort of architects collaborating with each other. And so, um, you know, I'm sure there are some other stories about that, and you guys must sort of team from time to time with other firms. But um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, about that. And then you're going to have tons of architects going in and inspecting every corner of it. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a great motive. Um, <laughs> no, we, um, we, we presented, as, as you may remember, we presented a design, but we also presented a lot of sketches. You know, we yes. had like a whole range of different versions of the stair. And I thought that was important to show a design, but also to show like the design process. And mm -hmm. I, I remember in the interview it came up, and you said, well, are you wed to this design or could it be flexible? And we said, sure, you know, this is a design process. You know, we designed it in two weeks, you know, and we're going to build it over a year, hopefully. So it'll evolve. And, mm -hmm. and I think that was an important thing to say and to do, because if we had stomped our feet and said, no, 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 it must be this way, we wouldn't have the stair, I think. And I think there were You might moments. not have had the job. Right, right. <laughs> but I think, I think there were moments where we said, well, how do we get this built? You know, working with Commodore, for sure, they're like, well, can it fit through the door? You know, the, you know constructability questions that, yes. that uh, we didn't, obviously didn't conceive of in the beginning. You know, meeting with Commodore, meeting with the different contractors. We actually interviewed five or six different guys. And you learn information from each guy, right? And you sort of write things down, and then you mm -hmm. ask the question to the next guy. And you know, you build <laughs> up experience, you know, because nobody had done this before. You know, these guys had, we had. Um, so I think being agile, mm -hmm. being flexible, uh, knowing when to say, well, we could accept that. That's still uh, a, a good idea. You know, the, the question about welding versus bolting, you know, that was something that happened last minute. You know, can we bolt it together? Would it be faster and more, more uh, precise? And cost effective. And cost effective. So that, I mean, that was something that came out of expertise that we didn't have and, and actually out of the discussions that, that we met with so many different people. Uh, the question of its reception and the kind of uh, the owner role. Um, <laughs> people joke, like, are you sure you want this job? You know, <laughs> you're going to have to respond to 3,000, you know, uh, articulate and critical voices. Um, 
And we said, sure, you know, we want to engage this community. We want to showcase something special. And I think mm -hmm. it will stand up to the scrutiny. But I do notice when I'm out there, you know, the guy who's grinding it, he knows that there are architects in this <laughs> building, you know. And he's grinding it because he knows an architect's going to look underneath and say, how did you attach that thing? So um, I think everybody was on their best behavior, you know, but also really invested in making it really special. You know, I feel like if it wasn't the BSA, maybe not everybody would be on their sort of tiptoes all the time. So I think that added a level. It raised the bar. It, you know, there's a kind of architects. We're sort of visual people. We're sort of very uh, self-conscious. Um, and we want the world to be just so. so Absolutely. Um, I Absolutely. Think it, it, it pushed everybody to, to perform better, you know, both, both uh, um, contractors, designers, clients. Everybody, I think, rose to the occasion because of the the visibility and the importance of it and what it means I think ultimately to this community to have something really excellent in, in Boston. Wonderful. Um, there's a question here and then Keith. Hi, uh, um, can you give us any specific examples of how the stair, the design of the stair evolved as a result of this collaborative <coughs> process? Sure. I mean when we first designed it it was made out of rhino, you know, had no thickness. Um, and we didn't know if it was possible, you know, and we sort of launched into this thing with like, yeah, we can make it, we can weld it, you know, sure. Talking to these guys, they're like, you know, it would take us, you know, eight weeks on site welding. And we're like, that sounds like a lot, you know, and, you know, you can imagine <laughs> in the field, the precision is not going to be there. So the question of, of prefabricating and bolting was something that came out of the discussions. Uh, they said we can assemble it in the shop, uh, ship it in parts, get it through the door. Uh, they actually installed it in less than two days, right? That was remarkable, you know, because they pull it off the truck and it fit together, you know, almost almost perfectly. And you'll see it's pretty, you know, pretty dead flat. Um, there were things were, that we gave up, you know, the, it, was, it was a kind of, uh, the two ceiling sides were supposed to come down. And we said, well, it's going to bias one side. It's important that it be asymmetrical. So we made some changes, you know, and, and it got, I think, simpler, but it got clearer mm -hmm. in a way. Um, at some point in the sort of dark days of value engineering, we said maybe maybe it could be a, a square, you know, profile or, you know, boxy. And Dan Peruzzi's like, nope, that's not the design. It's right. really about continuity. It has to roll. We're not going to, we're not going to, you know, value engineer that out because that's part of the design. And I, I thought, oh my God, thank goodness that I didn't have to say that, <laughs> but I was glad that the, the client side came in and defended the, the geometry, you know. We did, you know, in plan it was meant to taper, and we sort of straightened it out, and it still tapers in section, so it's still, I think, dramatic and, and sort of opening up, but uh, we did. Code issue. There, was, there were code <laughs> issues we didn't know about. We sort of learned a lot about that. Um, so um, we, we did discover a lot along the way, uh, and I think it got refined and it got better, actually. When you go there, you'll see it. It's it's cleaner, it's crisper, it seems like mo more coherent, um, and it was built. So far. So far. <laughs> Just easy. Yeah. A question on comments. First of all, in terms of comments, I think it's very important that you have a very Uh, well, uh, from the client side, I'd say the BSA. <laughs> no, and, and from the architect well, side, I'd say Howler and you. That up and say, on the next project, um, hey, we know a firm in Grand Rapids that can make these stairs and do this and do that. Um, where do they, where do they impinge? Who, who, who's going to keep the drawings for the stairs? Who actually owns them? Well, I think the, the intellectual property is, is, the, is the ownership of the architect, but certainly it's custom design for an owner. Um, I showed it to one of my students and he's like, oh, it's like the Scarpa stair at Castel Vecchio. And I was like, really? And he like Googled it up. In two seconds, he showed me an image of a steel stair that Scarpa designed with this, with this profile, you know. 
Um, I think in architecture, there's, we're awash in influence. You know, we see so much, and we sort of pick up things, and we, we transform them, we customize them, we re, we redeploy them. I think it's really hard to talk about originality in this day and age because so much is shared and so much is is uh, floating around. You know, I, you know, I teach. I'm surrounded by students. They're looking at things all the time. I'm looking over their shoulder at the things that they're looking at. You know, things come into our office. We have students in the office. Um, I, th I think, um, you know, I, there, there's a kind of anxiety of influence, but I think there's also a kind of ecstasy of influence. There's a kind of communication sort of world that we live in where, where ideas are exchanging and, and talking about collaboration, it's hard to talk about authorship mm. and, and, uh, and uh, originality. You know, I feel like the best designers are, are good at at, at shuffling ideas around, you know, idea has currency when it when it travels, when it moves. A week ago tomorrow morning, I heard an architect in the give a talk in two buildings over, who's a lawyer, and she said, "The owner paid for that. The owner owns that design." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, so, well, the BSA isn't going to make another one. He <laughs> 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 can have it. We all are involved in ecstasy of seeing a good design for the project done, and we kind of hope that the issue of uh, who owns it and who can use it goes away. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also things are, are changing. Questions of, of uh, authenticity, ownership, and, and ownership are, are changing. You know, students don't pay for music anymore, you know, they download it. You ask them, you know, and, and, and it's affecting markets, you know, like who's going to buy monographs anymore? You know, who's going to buy books by architects, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think we just, we live in a world where, where things are expected to change. Radiohead releases an, amble, an album, it's downloadable for free, the contribution is, you know, voluntary, you know? They're interested in circulation and, and exposure, and if you pay for that album, great. But they make their money on ticket sales at, at concerts, you know, and it doesn't translate directly into architecture. But I, I like the idea of circulating information, circulating code, circulating, you know, I like the idea of crowdsourcing. I like the idea of, of Wikipedia, and and uh, sharing ideas. At some point, we pulled our friends and we said, because um, I, I ask my friends all the time, do you have a detail for this? You know, do you have an example of that kind of contract? <laughs> and you know what? They send it to me, and I send it to them. You know, I think there is a kind of a collaborative spirit amongst certain architects that are like, "Hey, how did you do that thing? Let me send you a detail." You know, and I think that's what makes us better overall. You know, it's not about my detail, um, but mm -hmm. I think there is a kind of different attitude about sharing today. Correct. I think you probably know this better than I do, but the two Stebbins buildings down the street from each other is the one case where it was clearly if someone stole someone else. Plans. Which two? Stubbins Building, which he built for himself. Someone got a hold of the plans. Stubbins, Stubbins building, building, which, I'm sorry, which building exactly? The, the, the headquarters. For Stubbins, for Stubbins or for Stubbins Novartis? Headquarters building. Down the road, a few years ago, a clone started to appear on the ground. And it was the exact same building. They got a couple floors up in the air, and as you can imagine, it wasn't a collaborative effort. A lawyer showed up and stopped the construction, which because Stubbins didn't get any, you know, any fee for his design. He was not involved in it. I mean, just put the drawings. And I never thought in my career I'd ever see that, but it happened once. I think that's interesting. One of the, one of the things that um, that I was thinking about, Eric, when you were answering that last question, is getting back to the the Dubai client who wanted, you know, that that musical piece. And if you had taken that idea and just sort of built it, I, I wonder what your client might have even thought, yeah, you know, even yeah. if you were sort of willing to do it. Um, because they may feel like that yeah. they've owned it. I mean, it's a little different to a stare. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, and for us, we, we want to do something new. You know, we're not mm -hmm. interested in doing it again. Um, sure. And, and we, we get that all the time. We did a project in Athens for the Olympics with these fiber optic uh, rods, and we get you know, a request for that product about once a month. You know? mm. And we were thinking, maybe we should develop a product. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't really interest us. Right. You know? sure. I mean, we're, not, we're not industrial designers. We're not, 
we're not really trying to um, make, make loaves of them, make a product, pr produce them. Keith. A question. Um, I recall Eric and Audrey in the drawings. There was a layer of what you guys, what you guys are so good at, this interactive technology and responsibilities. Mm. Um, there was layers of that that were part of the initial design scheme for the space. And I was wondering, to implement that, did you bring in the Media Lab, or is that still part of the project, or has that been value equals less engineered out? Um, well, I mean, it, that was a sketch, right? The, the two-week yeah, competition. Those, those initial boards that showed yeah. a lot of interactivity on the street. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. we argued that, that the BSA's mission is about communication. Architecture right. communicates. Let's make it really something that, that information is exchanged and, and find ways to do that, whether it's display mechanisms or iPhone apps or, or terminals where you go in and, and log on. You know, some of that's evolved, but we're working with Pink Comma right now and Continuum. You know, Pink Comma is doing the exhibition design uh, where they're in introducing all these really <coughs> interesting uh, technological features where there's a kind of interactive map on the wall that you can use your smartphone to to add information to that map, so it's a kind of crowdsourced uh, interactive map of Boston. Um, Continuum is doing the wayfinding, graphics package, identity, uh, and they're introducing different sort of technologies. So um, again, we don't have to do it all. You know, I, I'm very happy to say to work with Mark and, and Chris at, at uh, Pink Comma mm -hmm. to work with Continuum and. You know, like we we trespass into other disciplines, but we also and vice versa and vice versa. <laughs> and we but we also acknowledge expertise. You know, mm -hmm. we don't know how to do these things. We find people that do, and you know, there's a there's a kind of DIY culture. In addition to a kind of shareware culture, there's a DIY culture where everybody thinks they can make it right, um, and and in some cases they can. But we do acknowledge expertise, and we do seek out expertise. You know, we find a sound composer, we hire a sound composer. They get paid a fee. They design sounds for us, and then we incorporate them into the into the project. Um, so, I, I think the kind of enthusiasm for uh, trespassing and the promiscuity that we like to celebrate in the practice um, does also acknowledge expertise and seek out expertise. You know, we're doing something for Harvard right now. Things we don't know anything about, but we are finding collaborators in the industry and in in uh, consultants that can help us achieve it. You know, our job is to pitch it. You know, to, to get everyone to buy in and mm -hmm. get excited about it, right. and then we can achieve you know almost anything. Another question? Yeah, my question is for Eric. Um, I, know, I know that a lot of your uh, work uses collaboration in tandem to innovation, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about sort of the overhead associated with that innovation and whether or not you feel as though you've been profitable and if the budgets for the projects you've just been really gifted with awesome clients or or if you could talk to the I hate to say it, but the practicality of having a firm that is so innovative. Yeah, sure. I mean I would say that we're not a kind of commercially viable practice in any way. So it's not something that <laughs> that I would recommend. Um, we do teach, you know, full time, so we're surrounded by kind of an atmosphere, I think, <coughs> of innovation, and a, a lot of the projects, particularly, you know, through Mijin's side, being at MIT, I think she's surrounded by an atmosphere of, of technology and innovation. So, we've sort of, you know, ingested mm -hmm. this this spirit, and and also benefited from the collaborations that are available through the Media Lab and through other other people that, that work in that mode. So, um, it's not something that that I would say, you know, it's strictly sort of contract or you know, check the books and sort of balance sheets. Uh, we do have a lot of projects that that are continuously losing money, or else, you know, they're just, uh, you know, we we like to say we've got money losing projects and money making projects, and we try to like use the money making ones to pay for the money losing ones. Um, doesn't always doesn't always work. We also work with a lot of student interns. You know, over the summer, we write grant applications. Uh, we get some money. We hire students. We work with them together. We develop ideas. And, and we can implement those things, you know, through through grant writing. You know, when the office is slow, we sit around and we we actually collectively write grant applications. We wrote a grant for the Graham Foundation. We got nine thousand dollars to do a book on the Big Dig, um, and that was because we were sitting in our office. There wasn't anything to do. We looked out the window and we said, "What's going on over there? We want to <laughs> know more. Uh, let's do some research." Great. And we wrote that application and, and we and we got it. So. 
I would encourage everybody, you know, don't just wait for the client to call, but you might have to sort of go out and find a client or be your own client, find, find resources or, mm -hmm. or find people that are equally invested. Sometimes we, um, like we just invite people over and we say, um, you know, we're, we're thinking about, um, you know, I, I was asked to participate in, in a project in India for a telecommunications company that wanted to figure out how to use a smartphone to interface with a building. Uh, it's a kind of interesting thing, not an architect's typical scope of work, but I invited all the kind of smart people that I knew that were interested in these issues, and we had them over for brunch, and we talked about it, and we said, how do you use your smartphone? You know, how can we suggest things to the client? We looked at different apps that were available, and we actually got a commission to design an app, you know, for this guy in India uh, to interface with the building uh, uh, monitoring system, um, but also to set up a social network within their company that would be geo specific. So, um, you know, that's something that uh, we sort of relied on our friends, you know, for, for sort of brainstorming. Um, and they were excited enough about the idea that they're willing to spend their Saturdays, you know, talking with us about it. Um, it was the breakfast. It was the breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes those, sometimes projects that don't necessarily uh, make a profit can lead to other projects too. Sure. So there's there's more than sort of that monetary benefit, although obviously, you know, you have to pay the bills. Yeah. No, I, I told you a story about AIA New Orleans invited us to do a, um, an installation for uh, a festival they had, and they had a $4,000 budget, and we said, great, you know, and we developed a, we used a flexible photovoltaics, uh, fabric, LED rope lights, and cell phone batteries to design a, a canopy that was self, uh, you know, it generated power and then it sort of, it lit up at night and when it was cloudy it didn't light up, but when it was sunny it lit up and it produced an incredible atmosphere, a kind of festive atmosphere. And we thought in New Orleans it's interesting because you don't really want to rely on the city electricity, we mm -hmm. wanted to sort of call attention <coughs> to the kind of uh, off the gridness of it. Uh, but we also wanted to talk about, um, you know, festive atmosphere, you know, we didn't want to have sustainability at the cost of pleasure, you know, we wanted to have them both. So we, we didn't know anything about photovoltaics uh, or microcontrollers that would regulate power in and power out. So we worked with Will. We didn't pay him, he just, you know, we said, hey, this is something cool, let's figure it out. Uh, he designed a custom microcontroller, we soldered it up, we flew it down, installed it. It cost more than $4,000 to do that. <laughs> Uh, but we submitted it to Architect Magazine. We won an R&D award almost immediately. And it was, it was out in the press, and, and we thought, that's great. You know, if we invest our own money in developing something that we're interested in, you know, sustainability, uh, desi designing something that I think was unprecedented in terms of the microcontroller, uh, and it got out in the world. You know, we don't have a marketing budget, but we have this money losing projects budget <laughs> but uh, it, it, it does uh, spread the word and I think I'd, I'd, you know, I'd invest in that in that kind of um, um, publicness any further questions any other stories you guys want to share Keith, you have to have some stories because I, you're, you're quite entrepreneurial like that as well <laughs> no, this is great listening to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much again for, for coming and for your comments. Thank you.